The story of lactose intolerance and lactase persistence is a story of human evolution. Human evolution did not stop once we reached our modern form 300,000 years ago. It continued and we are still evolving today. Statements like these often elicit vivid imagery of people merging with technology and becoming a race of super humanoids. While scenarios like that may not be as far into the future as we think, the evolutionary processes we've been experiencing are a little more subtle. Evolution is generally a long and gradual process with intermittent bouts of more rapid change. It takes time for species to expense with old traits and acquire new ones. This is partly because the environments around them do not change all that rapidly. Now and again, you may find a dramatic shift in climate due to a volcanic eruption or rapid cooling episode whereby some species will go extinct and certain populations will evolve to adapt to these new environments. However, species often find themselves in states of equilibrium with their environments for long periods. The human environment is one that has changed rapidly in the past 12,000 years or so, not by natural means, but by cultural intervention. We have culturally constructed a world that is vastly different from that of our prehistoric ancestors. So much so that the natural world is no longer the main driver of our evolution. Culture is. Like a species of fish adapting to warmer ocean temperatures, we are adapting to this novel environment we've created. This is called gene culture coevolution, which means that our biology and culture are in a conversation where they influence each other's trajectory. Changes in one affect the other. Milk consumption and the evolution of lactase persistence is a prime example of this. If we look at what human culture was like before 12,000 years ago, we see that our technology and behaviors were very different. We lived in nomadic groups of less than a few hundred individuals and were essentially restricted to just stone age tools. Importantly, we hunted for wild game and foraged for things like fruits, vegetables, tubers, and honey. All that changed once we learned to domesticate plants and animals. This was a huge cultural shift with many downstream effects, like the ability to live in permanent locations, population growth, and even eventually increased rates of infectious disease. It also led to downstream effects on our genetic makeup, particularly due to the introduction of a, a new nutrient source, milk. Prehistoric humans could not extract milk from the wild cattle they often hunted, but once we learned to domesticate them, that all changed. And when and where did this happen? It is widely believed that the origin of plant and animal domestication dates to roughly 12,000 years ago in what is known as the Fertile Crescent, an area in the Middle East spanning modern-day Iraq, Israel, Jordan, and several other countries. The earliest evidence we have of cattle domestication specifically comes from Anatolia, dating to 10,500 years ago. But just because we have evidence of domestication does not mean that humans were necessarily milking these animals at the time. They could have simply been eating them. The earliest evidence of actual milk consumption also comes from Anatolia and dates to around 9,000 years ago. There, archaeologists have found ceramics with residue of milk proteins and lipids. Another form of dairy, cheese processing, likely started a thousand years after that. So it wasn't long after cattle domestication that dairy consumption became a new avenue to acquire some extra calories. After many more thousands of years, this snowballed into the widespread market for milk and dairy products we see around us today. Aside from it being sourced from a non-human animal, the biggest difference between the milk consumption of prehistoric people and post-agricultural revolution people is that we now drink milk as adults. This is where we begin to see the role of evolution come into play. The primary source of nutrition for newborn humans, like most mammals, is their mother's breast milk. Also, like most mammals, prehistoric humans were weaned off of that breast milk by around one year of age. Throughout adolescence and adulthood, milk was largely absent from their diets. The human genome took this into consideration. There are structural genes that code for things like eye color, skin pigmentation, bone size, etc. Then there are regulatory genes which code for actions like turning on or off other genes or certain physiological mechanisms. When it comes to dairy consumption, regulatory genes are most important and here's why. Lactose is the sugar found in milk. It contains two sugar molecules, glucose and galactose, linked together. To be absorbed and utilized by the body, lactose must be broken down into its constituent sugars by an enzyme called lactase. 
which is produced in the small intestine. Specific regulatory genes code for the production of that enzyme. If those genes are turned on, then you can digest and absorb lactose. If not, then you may experience pain and discomfort. This is what we call lactose intolerance. Since prehistoric humans stopped consuming milk after about one, their genes that coded for lactase were turned off. Evolutionarily, it wouldn't make sense to continue spending energy and resources on an enzyme that no longer has a function. This became problematic for people who introduced dairy into their adult diets. This trait is called lactase non-persistence. Today, most people around the globe still fall into that category. However, some populations express the opposite trait, lactase persistence. In these populations, the genes that code for lactase do not turn off, allowing these people to continue breaking down and properly digesting lactose throughout adulthood. So where are these populations and why do they have this? Research suggests that lactase persistence is most common in Northern Europe. And the prevalence of this trait within different populations is as follows. Northern Europe, it's a little greater than 90% of their population. For Southern Europe and the Middle East, 50%. For non-pastoralist Asians and Africans, somewhere between five and 20% of their populations. and for pastoralist Africans, it can be between 50 and 90%. A team of researchers recently constructed an interactive map showing this distribution across the globe. As you can see, the bluer the dot, the higher the rate of lactase persistence within that population. And you can also note the larger cluster of blue in Northern Europe and to a lesser degree in East Africa. There are commonalities and differences among these populations. What's generally common amongst them is that they either practice pastoralism or are descendants of populations that did practice it. This means that people with cultural histories of drinking milk are better adapted to digesting it. What's different between these populations are the specific genes involved in their respective adaptations. The first study to really consider this was performed by geneticist Sarah Tishkoff and colleagues. The gene that was known to be associated with lactase persistence in Europeans up until this study was a single spot on chromosome 2 at location 13910T. They looked beyond Europe to investigate the genes of three African populations, Tanzanians, Kenyans, and Sudanese. They found that the gene associated with lactase persistence in these populations was at a different location on chromosome 2. 14010C. This study showcases what's known as convergent evolution. This is when different populations evolve the same adaptation to similar selective pressures independently from one another. According to Tishkoff and colleagues, these data provide a marked example of convergent evolution due to strong selective pressures resulting from shared cultural traits, that is, animal domestication and adult milk consumption. Since this study, researchers have found even more genetic variants associated with lactase persistence, with five we are now aware of. Concerning the nature of the selective pressures responsible for the increase in lactase persistence frequency in multiple locations, it seems clear that broadening the dietary repertoire and being able to derive glucose from milk were strongly favored in some populations. Drinking milk was advantageous for many human populations around the globe. This is supported by the fact that the genetic regions associated with lactase persistence have gone through some of the strongest selective pressures in the past 10,000 years, providing a selective advantage of up to four or 5% per generation. In a literature review, researchers came away with four main advantages that dairy consumption conferred to ancient humans. One is lifelong access to nutrient-rich milk. Two is lifelong access to carbohydrates and a fluid source, which would have been critical to pastoralists living in hot, arid environments. Three, lactose enhances calcium absorption, which may be compromised by low vitamin D synthesis in the high latitude environments of, of Europe. And lastly, number four, human consumption of bovine milk may accelerate reproductive maturation or physical growth or contribute to larger adult size, possibly due to milk's stimulatory effects on insulin growth factor one. Given that dairy provided these advantages to certain human populations in the past, does this mean you should consume it too? Not necessarily. 
This is a great example of why knowing your more immediate cultural history can inform your dietary decisions. If you come from a culture with a long line of dairy consumers, like those in, in Northern Europe or East Africa, you may not struggle with lactose intolerance. If you don't, then incorporating dairy into your diet may cause pain or discomfort. The decisions of your ancestors play a role in shaping who you are today and your ability or inability to digest milk is a simple example of this interconnectedness. So I want to leave you with a question. What cultural traits do we have today that will influence the DNA of future generations, of future humans? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Additionally, make sure you click like and hit subscribe so that way you're notified when I post future episodes.